Welcome to the Geotechnical Engineering Podcast, a podcast focused on helping geotechnical engineers stay up to date with technical trends in the field. I'm your host, Jared Green, and I've been practicing as a geotechnical engineer for over 17 and a half years. And in addition to practicing engineering, I enjoy mentoring young engineers and first-generation college students. I've focused on helping to increase the number of pre-college students that are interested in STEAM majors and fields. By STEAM, I mean science, technology, engineering, art, and mathematics. In this episode of the Geotechnical Engineering Podcast, I am excited to be interviewing Karen Durham Aguilera, more commonly known as KDA, who is the Executive Director at the Army National Military Cemeteries. We will be talking about her career and her role at the Army National Military Cemeteries and also, she's gonna provide some great advice to geotechnical engineering leaders. Before I tell you more about our guests, I'd like to let you know that the Engineering Management Institute has several engineering related podcasts. The newest is This Week in Civil Engineering, and it's coming very soon. It will be a short weekly podcast with all the important news in the world of civil engineering. You can find all these content channels on their civil engineering media and entertainment page at cement.media. Again, that's cement.media. Now, I'd like to formally introduce you to our guest for today, Ms. KDA. Ms. Karen Durham Aguilera is the Executive Director of Army National Military Cemeteries and the Arlington National Cemetery serving as the principal advisor to the Secretary of the Army on all matters related to Army cemeteries. Ms. Durham Aguilera administers and oversees policies, doctrine, plans, and standards with all stakeholders to include the Army staff, major commands, and the other services. She establishes and sustains gravesite accountability, provides technical guidance, training, staff assistance and inspections, educates burial exceptions, disinterment expansion requests at nearly 40 army cemeteries across the nation. As executive director, she oversees the nation's premier military cemetery, over 6,500 burials, 4,000 ceremonies, and 3.5 million visitors each year. And she manages a $70.8 million annual budget, a $130 million in existing major constructions and expansions, and the planning of a new $350 million expansion. KDA has a long and very impressive bio that we'll include in the show notes of this episode. And with that, let's jump right into our conversation with Ms. KDA. KDA, welcome to the Geotechnical Engineering Podcast. We are honored to have you. How are you feeling? Uh, actually, I'm feeling pretty good, and um, it is really uh, my honor and my privilege. I just, I just love talking about being an, an engineer and especially what engineers can do in this world. Excellent, excellent. We appreciate it. We went through your bio for the listeners, and I got to say, you have an impressive <laughs> bio, and I'm sure uh, I'm not the first geez. person to say that to you. <laughs> well, I've been really fortunate. I've been really blessed in my career that I've been able to do a lot of different things in many parts of the world. Wonderful, wonderful. Well, Katie, a, sharing your bio with the audience, you know, it's obvious that you truly have had an incredibly accomplished career. Now, when you think about it in your own words, can you share with the listeners, let's say, a, a brief synopsis of your career journey, and then also let them know today, like, what does a daily day look like for you in your current position? All right, thank you. Well, first, uh, I am an engineer. I'm originally from Louisville, Kentucky. That's Louisville for everybody outside Kentucky. <laughs> and I went to the University of Louisville. I received both my bachelor's um, and my master's there in Louisville. And Louisville's engineering school, which at the time was called Speed Scientific School, had a requirement for anyone getting a master's, and that's that you had to work uh, a year as a co-op. Mm. Didn't necessarily have to be a continuous year, but I was lucky enough that, that I started my co-op early, working for an AE firm in Louisville, before it actually began, while I was, while I was still taking classes. Okay. And so that was really my first introduction to being out in the field, being out in the real field with a construction crew, wow. as well as working with the engineer on, on the technical piece. And then the other part of that co-op is I spent about nine months working for the Tennessee Valley Authority. 
mm. uh, in Tennessee for the Hartsfield nuclear uh, plant, which never came online. But at the time, it was this massive construction site. And so the biggest things that I learned from that, that's the first time I became aware of scheduling, you know, using, using um, um, earned value, you know, critical path method, just a whole bit. Mm -hmm. And the other thing that was very rare at that, at that time is there were the two lead engineers that I worked with were both women. Oh, wow. Which at that time was extremely rare. I mean, even when I graduated from U of L with my master's mm -hmm. in civil engineering and I focused on, on geotech, there were only five of us counting me. Wow. So yeah, it was, it was, things have changed a lot, which I'm, I'm glad to say over the years. Yeah. I started out in private industry, uh, first working for an AE firm in Decatur, Alabama. And the thing I still remember to this day is there was a, a water tank foundation that the firm had been hired to design. Mm -hmm. And the lead engineer let me do the design. And it was in a, an area that was mostly limestone. Okay. So he designed the blasting pattern to actually identify all of that. And I designed the foundation. Wow. And after I left that firm, about a year later, he sent me a postcard. Uh -huh. It was a picture of the water tank. Oh, and how cool is said, that? <laughs> yeah, all it said was, your water tank is still standing. <laughs> <laughs> so I guess I was successful. There you go. <laughs> and, and then after that, I found myself in New Orleans. And I worked for a uh, geotech firm, uh, McClellan, which changed names a couple of times and owners since then. Okay. But I spent most of that my time working offshore. Okay. So I was working on uh, jack-up barges or drill rigs, literally doing calculations by hand. Wow for piles where we'd have a drill rig just waiting for us to be done so they would know where to set and how deep to set their foundation. Wow. <laughs> Incredible experience because that meant that we were doing literally soil borings, you know, in the ocean, doing the analysis on the ship. Yeah. And then I was doing actual calculations, literally using a calculator, which means you really had to know how to do all that. Exactly. Calculation piles and everything else is incredible. I couldn't do it now, but at the time, that's what we were doing. Wow. And again, I was, I was the one and only woman that was doing that. Wow. At this time, at, at some time during that, the uh, oil, offshore and onshore oil support industry took a nosedive to including AE firms. And the U.S. Army Corps of Engineers was looking for engineers, and they were looking for engineers that had deep foundation experience mm. because they were doing an in-house design of the old river auxiliary structure, which was a dam and spillway. Okay. So all of my experience at that time was in deep foundations. Wow. So I was lucky enough that I heard about it. They were recruiting people and they hired me directly. And so that's how I ended up having what eventually became a 34 year career with the Army Corps of Engineers. Wow. Started out all in geotech, though at the time we called it Soils and Foundations. Okay. You know, it became known as, as, as geotech uh, eventually. And I was able to be both the, uh, the lead engineer for the design of, of the uh, pile foundation for the Old River Auxiliary Structure and after a couple of years, I realized that I really liked being a geotech. I could be the just, best geotech in the world, but I would only have limited influence and a limited, you know, lim limited, uh, a limited sphere. Makes sense. So I decided to switch over because I really like construction. Mm. I switched over to being a construction manager, you know, project engineer. Okay. And I never looked back from that. So from there, I went on to uh, Germany. I was in Germany for nearly four years in a couple of different places as a project wow. engineer and a supervisory project engineer where I uh, worked on things like uh, design build, family housing projects, mm -hmm. uh, weapon sites, just all kinds of things. But what really stood out about that, aside from the experience, were two things. First, you know, I was in my late 20s at the time, thought I knew everything like most of us do when we're that age. <laughs> exactly. And then I find myself overseas. And I became aware that the world had a very different view of America than we did. Wow. And, all. and so that we really just, it just really made a mark on me of just finding out about different perspectives and different attitudes. And yeah. a lot of the attitudes towards Americans was not good. Wow. Uh, the sec second place that I worked over there, I remember this clearly. It took me 20 different times to find an apartment because the first 19, I was told we don't, we don't rent to single women. Wow. Or we don't rent to Americans. Wow. And uh, even though I was only in my late 20s, yeah. um, I was considered a spinster. Wow. And I had numerous German men that I was working with tell me, don't worry, maybe you'll find yourself a good husband. <laughs> True story. 
Unbelievable. <laughs> but anyway, the other thing that I learned to do because of one of the high visibility projects that was on is be able to, to clearly brief people at high levels, okay. three-star, four-star generals, cabinet secretaries, just all kinds of people that you can think of. And that was my early exposure to that. And I found out that even though I'm an engineer, I actually had a knack for it. Wow. <laughs> Amazingly enough, I was good, I was good at it. Wow. Um, from there, I went to uh, Pueblo, Colorado. I was a resident engineer on, on flood control works. And at this time, it was the first ever cost-shared uh, flood control project between the Army Corps of Engineers and the local government entity. Okay. And then because we finished early, I was able to bring that project in early and under budget. I found myself at Holloman Air Force Base for less than a year, again, as a resident engineer for all types of military construction. Uh, support facilities mostly to the Air Force, of course. Okay. And then I spent the next several years at Cannon Air Force Base as a resident engineer. And this was lots of first for me. Uh, design bill, but not only being the resident engineer, I was able to talk the agency into allowing me to be the project manager as well, <laughs> at least during the design phase. Okay. Uh, major hospital renovations, which I had never done before, and very, very complicated to oversee that kind of work. And then after that, I was able to go to uh, Anniston, Alabama, as the area engineer on a chem chemical demilitarization facility. These are facilities that were built to dispose of uh, mustard gas and nerve gas agents that had been stored in bunkers mm. since the early days of the Cold War. Wow. And the last thing you want in, in your neighborhood, you know, is stored, you know, nerve agents. For real, yeah. But aside oh. from being very technically complex, because this was one of the first one of those facilities that had been done to reduce that stockpile, there was very hostile public sentiment for that. Mm. There were people that, that did not want us to be doing that at all, just despite the good it would be doing for the community, mm -hmm. to the point that where people would protest, you know, lay down in front of the excavators. Uh, our workforce, and we had a very diverse workforce from all over the world, but some of our workforce that had children in school, when their, children, when their, their uh, schoolmates found out what their parents did, then the school were being harassed. Really? Wow. So, yeah. So that's when I first really became aware of true risk communication. Okay. Took some courses on how to, how to successfully communicate difficult topics with the public. Mm. And some of those techniques I'm still using today. And so what that taught me is, aside from the, the technical aspect, uh, which, which was incredible, it's the public aspect, especially the risk communication part on things that, that the public initially is, is very much against. Wow. I mean, this is one of those places where universities were giving students college credit for civil unrest and would, would bust them out of, even from different states wow. uh, into, into the area to attend public meetings. It was, it was really amazing. Wow. Really amazing. Fascinating. Um, that makes it complicated to do what you're supposed to do. <laughs> it, it, it made it very complicated also to stay focused. I had, uh, this was a, what's called a GOCO, in other words, government government-owned, contractor-operated. Okay. So that meant design build during the design and construction phase. And then once it was commissioned, and then it was contractor-operated to actually dispose of the, of the stored um, stove, near gas and mustard gas. Okay. But it really meant that the team was embedded throughout. Wow. I had the, um, the contractor's foreman. Um, actually, he was, he was the overall project manager tell me uh, that I had an ability to see through smoke, in other words, see through all the different things that were going on and, mm -hmm. and keep the team focused on what was important. That's incredible. I was, it, was, it was really difficult. Um, the other thing that I did while I was there, you know, first uh, I, I spent the first year of that before the construction really got going, standing up the construction program for all of the Kim D mill okay. sites that the uh, Army Corps of Engineers was taking on. And then I also spent several months in the Army Corps of Engineer headquarters where I really, really learned how government works, what okay. it takes to get a project through, all the different wickets of appropriations, uh, the different federal agencies that are involved, and, and, and also the network. So I learned a lot of lessons that I, I, I came to use later on in my career. Wow. Um, after a few years there, I went over to Sacramento, and I was the chief of construction operations that operated across several states for a variety of missions, not just uh, military construction, but civil works that included uh, dams, mm -hmm. flood control dams, um, numerous construction projects of, of all different types. 
Um, and then also disaster response. So between the detail and that, that's when I first got involved in flood fighting okay. and responding to other disasters. And while I was there, I did another detail at the Army Corps headquarters. This time as an acting senior executive, which at the time they had never done before, plus never had somebody there from the field. Okay. And in Washington, D.C., anybody outside the Beltway, Washington, D.C. is called in the field. Okay. Wow. Not the real field. You okay. Know, <laughs> what I would call the real field, which is in an operating site, yeah. construction or a dam or whatever. But I was, I was in, in the office located in Sacramento that oversaw that work all these different places. Okay. But bringing somebody in out from outside the Beltway was, at that time was something they had never done. Wow. So what I did was give them ground truth of the impact of policies that they were trying to promulgate. Okay. And what it gave me was really opening up my eyes on, on first what a senior executive would, could do, mm-hmm. that I could do it, that I could do it. Yeah. And if I wanted to continue to span my sphere of influence, then that would be my next step. And I had never thought about that before. Okay. And then I had people encouraging me, other SESs as well as general officers, saying, hey, you can do this, you need, you need to apply. Wow, okay. So I did, and so I became a senior executive, which has been over 17 years now. I started out Northwestern Division in Portland, Oregon, which oversaw work across 14 states uh, to include some really complex civil works projects, such as the high head dams and hydropower all up and down the Miss, uh, Miss Missouri River, okay. and the uh, high head dams and hydropower across the Columbia and Snake Rivers, and be able to actually operate to deliver all those different missions, flood control, water supply, navigation, but also do it and meet the needs of the endangered species. In the Columbia, it's salmon, and in the Missouri, it was several different species. So being able to do that, work across different agencies, uh, at the time for the Missouri River, there was litigation from 14 different states, Indian tribes, numerous other stakeholders, SGOs, Mm -hmm. it was really incredible. So we were actually, were successful. I really, uh, just invaluable experience. Wow. While I was there, uh, one of the things that the Army Corps of Engineers does, since the days of Vietnam, they've been deploying engineers to the battlefield. Okay. And so I deployed to Iraq. Really? Um, I was, yes, yes. I was there wow. as, the, as the director of reconstruction for the Army. And reconstruction means hospitals, clinics, schools, police stations, as well as utilities, such as getting oil refineries, you know, water and sewage systems working. Um, it was just really incredible. So for a couple of reasons. First, um, I really didn't have a true appreciation of what our military does. Yeah. And this was a joint position. In other words, all branches of the armed forces, which I had never had before, as well as civilians from, from across the world to include uh, Iraqi nationals. But to see what our military does and to see our Marines, especially the way they're geared and they're on the front lines, is just, it, it, I just can't even describe wow. what it means for what our military goes through. Wow. You know, and they do, they do that for us, for our yeah. liberty and our freedom. It's just truly amazing. It's powerful. I had a two-star general that sent me over there saying, you will never be the same once you've done this. Wow. And he was absolutely right. Really? But there were wow. a lot of good things, too, aside from those, those complexities and being in a war zone and, and learning how to be embedded with the military. I, I, one of the things I was really proud of is I set up a network for Iraqi women-owned businesses, hmm. small-owned businesses, so they could partner with, with general uh, construction firms, you know, not just in construction, but also some other businesses like IT services okay. and supply contracts. Because at that time... One of the things that had been going on in Iraq was uh, in the past, women had a lot of, a lot of freedom, mm-hmm. you know, but under, under the Ayatollah and everything else and under Saddam, they did not, they didn't have much at all. Mm. So it was really good to be able to gather those women in and help, help try to make things better. Definitely. Uh, the other thing is as an engineer, I was, it was shocking to learn how uh, bad a state the country was in. Hmm. Basically, if you were in Saddam Hussein's inner circle, you had working water and sewer, so they thought. They, they really weren't operating wow. the way they thought. Or he would direct that a, a, a dam such as Mosul Dam was actually built over a sinkstone area. And then the, the Iraqis hmm. spent years filling those sinkholes with grout, and eventually the Army Corps of Engineers, and then in partnership with Iraq, was able to, to repair that. Wow. Just, just unbelievable stuff. Wow. But, um, I also learned for the first time 
truly how to manage a large program, which at that time was uh, tens of billions of dollars. You know, using our earned value, you know, being able to predict, look for trends. And so that, that experience uh, really stood me well later on. So once I got back, I spent a, a little more time um, in Portland, and then I went to New Orleans. Okay. Because while I was in Iraq, mm -hmm. Hurricane Katrina hit. Yeah. And even though we, wow. were, in our, we were in our own nightmare, just, uh, just watching the images on TV yeah. of, what, uh, of what Katrina did was just astounding. And one of my senior people was a colonel, an army colonel who was part of the uh, the guard in Louisiana, 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 <laughs> and so he he just I have to go home, I have to go home, you know, and help. I said, sure, you can go home as soon as you tell me what your replacement, where your replacement is, where he's getting here because we have a mission here too. <laughs> so that was incredible. So when I when I got back after a few months, the uh, Army Corps headquarters was asking me if I wanted to go to New Orleans, and lead, you know, the development and execution of that post Katrina uh, repair and restoration program wow. for, for the storm damage reduction. And my first uh, response was, hell no, I just got <laughs> back from Iraq. <laughs> and thank, thank, thank God the, uh, the person I was working for, his two star general said, oh, wait a second, go down, see what's going on, talk to okay. everybody. And he was absolutely right. Yeah. And after I did that, I came back, I said, put me in coach, put me in. Put there me you in. go. You know, it's, it's hard <laughs> as heck but it's historic and it's gratifying. I want yeah. to do it. And so the chief engineers uh, just decided to do that. Wow. Um, other than being deployed and then despite the other challenges, hardest thing I've ever done, not just technically, it was a $14.7 billion program with mm -hmm. nearly 400 construction contracts and R and D and all kinds of things, but it was under intense public eye criticism, constantly being under a microscope because of the failures yeah that occurred that the core was just a part of. Yeah. The story was the core was to blame. The reality was the core was a part of that. There were many people that contributed to making errors in judgment, design, and what they thought was, was, a, was a protection system mm. at the time that it was built. And even that was only partly built. So I spent several years there. I was proud to say that we actually accomplished that and we did it in, in, in incredible time, literally uh, most of it in about uh, four years. Wow. Um, to include just huge multi-billion dollar uh, design build programs. Um, most public speaking I've ever done, you know, not just to <laughs> technical, but, but communities, media, right? community, media, yeah. testifying before Congress, testifying to state government. I had already, when I was in Portland, I did testify on the Hill for some things we were doing but never to the extent that I did when I was in New Orleans. Um, from there, we got to the point where the program was far enough along that we did not need a senior executive on the ground. Um, the Corps uh, brought me into to their headquarters, and I spent six years there as the director of contingency operations. So that was leading the federal engineer disaster response across a whole host of disasters to include floods, tornadoes, hurricanes, wildfire, mudslides, and in particular, uh, Superstorm Sandy. Uh, but I also put together the engineering teams forward, the support of the warfighter on the battlefield, mostly in Iraq and Afghanistan. So just an incredible amount of experience. And some of the big things on that were Sandy. So our Superstorm Sandy was the first true national realization of resiliency. In other words, how to get hardening measures in place, how to truly be prepared, how to absorb and bounce back what you have to do if you're going to live near a coast, but even have, having to protect your utilities from inland flooding, such as the Correct. subway system in New York City. Correct. All kinds of things that people hadn't thought of or were not prepared for. Um, I think things really changed after that. I would not say the nation's where it needs to be, but the realization, especially state and local governments, the measures that they take is, is just mm -hmm. extraordinary. Yeah. After some years of that, uh, I'll never forget this, the... Uh, I was at a uh, tabletop exercise for Northcom okay. um, in uh, Colorado, and I was about to fly back, and on the plane with me was the deputy administrator of FEMA. And he said, hey, I need to talk to you. Are you getting stale? <laughs> I'm like, am I? <laughs> yeah, I would hear a response to that. <laughs> I know, I know. What do you say to something like that? And, and he said, um, what big things do you have in mind that you haven't yet accomplished? And he said, I don't mean 
tweaking along the edges or making adjustments. What big things do you have in mind that you haven't yet accomplished? And I didn't have an answer for that. <laughs> You've done a lot at this point. You yeah, know? Exactly. And so <laughs> what he really made me think yeah. that it was time to also think about what else I could do. Wow. What else can I give? Mm -hmm. And so at this point, I'd already been spending several years, really after Hurricane Sandy, when I, I needed something bigger, you know, and then just always focusing on the mission. Um, and I was a part of a group called the Patriot Guard Riders. And the Patriot Guard Riders is a motorcycle-based group because yeah. I ride motorcycles. Okay. And they established themselves in 2005 to basically shield families um, who were grieving were at literally burial services for their loved one who mm. were fallen, their loved ones who had fallen in battle. Okay. And yet there was a group that were protesting soldiers. It was very ugly. Wow. And so Patriot Guard had evolved since then to not only support families at, at, uh, at burial services and to provide escorts, but also do things like greet World War II honor flights. Wow. You know, thank our greatest <laughs> generation or or do ribbon cuttings for providing smart homes to disabled vets, just all kinds of things. That's awesome. So I had a passion for trying to serve our veterans and families, you know, beyond, you know, just the, the military aspect programs that I've been involved in. And so prominent of that is Arlington National Cemetery. Well, at that time, um, the Army, Secretary of the Army decided to externally recruit a further executive director. I say externally recruit because this, this is a, a equivalent to a three-star general position. And prior to that, they were assigning people already at that level. Wow. Well, they decided to compete for it. Well, I, just, I competed. I decided to compete because I had the passion yeah. as well as the, the skills, not just running big programs, being able to, to work with other government entities and the public and the Hill because it's very political. Um, but also there is uh, one of the biggest strategic challenges with the, it was the infrastructure, mm. a very old and aging infrastructure that needed repair and modernization. Well, being an engineer and a lot of the programs that I've done was, was an excellent fit. Yeah. So the good news is I competed, I was honored, I was selected. And so that's what I've been doing for the last three and a half years. Okay. And then just one other tidbit on that. I did not know this at the time that I was selected. I'm dual hatted. I'm not only the executive director of Arlington National Cemetery, and the cemetery for the soldiers and airmen's home in Northwest, uh, Upper Northwest DC, which is actually older than Arlington. Hmm. I'm also the headquarters principals for all army cemeteries. <laughs> and there's, there's wow. another 30 of them that are located across the nation. And so being able to, uh, there wasn't really a good program, stand up that program for those standards as well as take care of Arlington. For me, it's felt like a new passion the second career, but all of those skills that I had built up is what, what made me equipped to be able to do this. Wow. That is just incredible. <laughs> I mean, literally, like your journey sounds like the journey of like five or six or seven people together. And well, I'm, you... <laughs> I'm, Jared, I've moved so many times. I have to look at my resume to see yeah. how many times I've actually moved or the dates. But again, I just, I've been incredibly fortunate. Uh, yeah. A lot of it's being in the right place at the right time, yeah. being willing to take a chance, but it's also by having an excellent support network. Wow. Well, looking at the, uh, the tapestry of that journey, it's almost like it was created for you to be right where you are right now, you know? I, will, I truly um, believe that, you know, that right, it's always about the right person at the right time because mm -hmm. things do change. And I think that for everything that I've described to you, I was the right person at that right time. Yeah. But then there's also having the right team correct, and then being able to collaborate with people way beyond your team so that to, to be successful. Makes a lot of sense. I mean, when you look at, so Arlington National, National Cemetery, it's a very big place. <laughs> it's huge. And I understand it's 624 acres. Uh, you have an average of about 30 burials weekdays and 10 on Saturdays. That's a lot of responsibility. That's a lot of coordination. How do you manage work-life balance? How do you do well, that? Well, several things. First, it's 639 acres now. 639? Yes. My this, year, this year, we did a land exchange with the National oh, Park Service okay. where we picked up Memorial Avenue, you know, from the entrance just beyond Arlington National Cemetery all the way into the cemetery and actually owned property inside the cemetery. Wow. So it's all ours now. And then we also gave them an internal parcel because they own and operate the Arlington House. Okay. You know, the old, the old Lee Manor. 
Um, and then we do have nearly 30 burials a day, every a day. single day, wow. which is around 7,000 a year. There are literally 4,000 to 5,000 families waiting to be scheduled at any wow. one time because the demand is huge. And that's across all branch of the armed services. Okay. And so how do we manage that? Well, first, you know, personally, everyone needs to decompress. Hmm. Whatever your passion is, we all need that. Or we're not going to be able to have a clear mind and be able to deal with, with all the things that are thrown our way yeah. because things are always changing, like the COVID environment we've all been in. Yeah. So the way I decompress is first riding my Harley. <laughs> okay. Uh, both my husband and I ride. So on the weekends, you, is, you can find us out on the, the beautiful byways of Virginia or even nice. further. Nice. And then, of course, working out. You know, I really believe that you, to be mentally fit, you need to be physically fit. Yeah. So for me, it's riding a bicycle. Washington, D.C. has a wonderful network of bicycle trails. Mm -hmm. And then I've been lifting weights for 30 plus years. I'm a former competitor. Okay. So I'm, I've never quit doing that as well. Excellent. Excellent. Wow. So that's, that's the work-life balance. When I, when, I hear your, when I hear your career, I, I, I have to imagine that you had some hurdles. I have to imagine you had some hardships. You know, what can you share with our listeners for how are you able to overcome any hardships over the years? So everyone has struggles as they, as they you know, pursue their profession. Mm -hmm. um, for many years, as I alluded to earlier, there were very few women. Yeah. You know, not just getting out of school, but as I focused pretty early on on being in the field and being in construction, on construction projects and being in a position of authority, there were very few women. Often I was the one and only. Wow. I was constantly being uh, uh, taken for the secretary or the public affairs person or all kinds of things. So I'm constantly being questioned and having to prove myself. I think we all have to prove ourselves. Yeah. But at least then for women, it was even more so. I'm really great. To, it's really great to see how that's changed over the years. Yeah. Um, there are still not as many women in positions of being a senior executive, you know, or the CEO types, but it's absolutely gotten a lot better. Correct. But I think the other challenge though, is what I would call bureaucracy and inertia. Hmm. Being able to convince colleagues, supervisors, people that, that work for me, but especially decision makers, about taking an informed risk to deliver a programs or project and do it in ways that we previously thought were impossible. Mm. Everything from construction management at risk acquisition to cost sharing the design piece of the design build program to using a risk based total project or program cost estimate and going after that. As the, as the money that's needed for the investment of the project. And then of course you have to manage within that. I can give numerous examples, but, but learning how to socialize, collaborate mm -hmm. and convince a direction, especially in contrast to a past decision that people had thought was once that decision's made, it cannot be shared or changed mm -hmm. and taken a new course. I think that's, uh, that's, those are probably the big hurdles I've had all along to include yeah. my, my current job. You know, so being able to figure out what those hurdles are and, and work through that and convincing others to overcome it and take a new path is, is probably the biggest challenge regardless of where I've been. Wow. Probably one of the biggest challenges that I've had. Thank you for that. I know it's going to mean a lot to our listeners. Wow. And when you think about your profession, what, what would you say is a common myth about your profession or field that you want to debunk? I think a common myth is that engineers can't talk. Yeah, there you go. <laughs> you, know, well, you know, engineers are introverts. And if, if you go any of the leadership profiles, engineers as a group are introverts. And there's, uh -huh. some, there's some funny jokes uh, about that. But introverts that can't communicate in the real world. So engineers first have to know how to verbally and clearly communicate, both verbally and the written product. Because if we don't tell our story, we're not going to be able to convince anyone. Hmm. And that that's, that's, could be a, a design decision. It could be some of the things that I've talked about with, with project or program delivery, but we have to have the ability to be able to do that. And for a lot of us, that means getting outside our comfort zone. Yeah. And I was fortunate enough that I, I was involved in projects at an early age that were very visible, that were publicly controversial. Mm -hmm. And for whatever reason, I learned I had a knack for it, but I still needed training. Yeah. So taking risk communication, training and then going out and actually applying it in the real world and then some of the higher level courses as well you know i said i I'd let you know i had a bachelor's and a master's um, i'm a registered uh professional engineer in the state of louisiana okay uh, but i've also taken advanced 
uh, courses uh, at Harvard, John Kennedy School of Government, okay. Crisis and Leadership, and some of the international uh, programs as well, which are excellent because of the people that are in there from all over the world. You know, so taking those personal risks, learning how to talk, being able to convince others, you know, not just with the written product and verbally, I think those are really key to, to engineers to truly be successful. Definitely, definitely. And, you know, when, when you have those uh, skill sets behind you it, or, or within you, I should say, it allows you to step out of your comfort zone more. We don't want to step out of the comfort zone, but after we do it and we survive, we say, okay, well, I'll try this next thing. And it looks like that was allowing you to really just keep climbing, you know? Yes, yes. I, I truly believe that that was a big part of it. Awesome. Katie, I understand that uh, you've given advice regarding what it means to be an effective leader. And I, I saw, I read that you have the four C's, competence, <laughs> commitment, courage, and caring. Can you tell our listeners a little bit about that? Yes. Of course, competence is competence in your field. Okay. You know, none of us knows everything, but if you're leading a group of people, if you don't have the technical competence to really stand what it's about, you cannot give, you cannot give direction. You can't help people learn. And your chances are you're going to end up with the wrong action because you truly don't understand it. Yeah. But you have to perform. You have to perform. Mm -hmm. Commitment, commitment is, is also what I would call passion. Okay. If you're not truly committed, regardless of where you're working and what you're doing, if you don't have passion for it, you're not going to last long. You're not going to be happy. But everybody around you will know it. Wow. You know, that's something that you cannot, you cannot uh, hide. Courage, of course, is taking personal risk, uh, but it's also taking the risk to be able to, to uh, see another way, have a new idea. Of course, it makes sense, and then be able to convince others of it. And then caring is all about people. And we don't care about people. We're trying to lead people. People know. You know, I've, I've had some supervisors in the past that were just dreadful. So I learned from them how to not be a good supervisor. But I also had some that were fantastic. Okay. They were absolutely fantastic. You know, so being able to learn from those good examples and being able to lead people, because w without that, uh, no one's going to be successful. And we're also not going to be happy. Yeah, that's true. Because we, no matter what, you need to enjoy what you're doing. Well said, well said. What advice would you give to leaders? Maybe somebody that's new to a leadership role and they're having a challenge with the four C's. I mean, what advice would you give them? I think I, my first advice would be to listen. Mm -hmm. uh, my second advice would be to listen. <laughs> and my, my third advice would be to repeat step one. Okay. And, I mean, you, have to, you have to allow others to be heard and be ready and willing to adopt their ideas, but you also have to be able to give clear direction and guidance. That means setting a vision, having the team work the details to carry out the vision, but you have to have the ability to adapt and change that vision as the work proceeds. In other words, okay. don't assume just because you had a plan in place that it cannot be changed. I worked for a three-star general chief engineers once that told us, always communicate so as to not to be misunderstood. Mm. Well, that sounds so simple, but that is truly difficult yeah. to clearly communicate intent so that the team understands intent because if they guess wrong, they're not going to be happy. You're not going to be happy because they got it wrong. But then imagine the damage you're doing if you're going and correcting the team oh. because you didn't clearly, you weren't clearly understood as what we were trying to do. Wow. So I think that's one of the hardest things for any of us, but that, that's the best advice that, that I can give. The next one is watch, and you mentioned this earlier, you've mm -hmm. got to watch for stress and burnout. Yeah. That yeah. is real. And for yeah. the pace we have at Arlington National Cemetery, uh, some of the things I've done since I've been here is with the team is to address those things that were stressors. Mm. The pace, lack of training opportunities, I can give many examples. We're constantly looking out for each other putting in things like flexible hours, training breaks, training opportunities, you know, even, even just changing, changing jobs, you know, yeah. just, just changing places with someone can, can alleviate stress. But it's, we really have to be careful about stress and burnout because people stress in different ways. Oh. Um, what is stress to some is just the normal day for, for others. <laughs> so. So true. So true. When you think about a good engineering manager, a good engineering leader, what are some of the qualities and characteristics that you, uh, that, that come to mind? So those are some of the things being a, a patient listener. Okay. One of my weaknesses is impatience. I always want to get to the actions. I've had to really discipline myself, not always successful to discipline myself to, to truly be that patient listener. Okay. I think the other thing is, is you have to be able to identify the end state. Because if you don't have the end goal in mind, you're not going to be able to leave a team and you're going to stumble along the way. 
in the engineering business, that can mean getting out of scope, getting out of budget, not being able to deliver on time, where you end up with you know, an unhappy client, an unhappy public, or whatever the case may be. Okay. Um, so having that in state of mind while truly achieving quality, which includes schedule, cost, drivers, et cetera. And then the other thing is being able to work as a team. Yeah. And these days, that means a matrix team. Hmm. It's not everyone who works directly for you. It's a matrix team of, of that function. But in the Army lingo, especially now, we have distributed operations. We never quit working under the COVID <laughs> restrictions. But we're working in a different way. Yeah. You know, we, we have people that are working virtually or we're teleworking or we have people on the ground. Or we have people in numerous geographical areas. So being able to truly walk, work across that matrix team is really key. And for us, I don't think we're ever going to go back to where we were prior to COVID because we've learned how effective and efficient we can be. But that being said, if you don't have that personal touch at the time you need it, people will end up isolated and disengaged. Wow. And then not only will you affect the work, but you're going to affect people's well-being as well. So true. So true. Wow. A lot of good stuff here. A lot of good stuff here. Uh, we're going to come back in just a moment, take a quick break, we're gonna, and then we're going to close this out with KDA in our Career Factor Safety In segment. Yeah, Stick all right. Around. Thank you. Welcome back, and it's time for our Career Factor Safety In segment. In geotechnical engineering, just like many disciplines of engineering, it's important to incorporate a factor of safety into your design. But what about incorporating a factor of safety into your actual career? Today, of course, we're speaking with Ms. Karen Durham Aguilera, more commonly known as KDA. <laughs> KDA, with all that you have done, one would wonder, wow, what can an engineer do? When we think about a factor of safety for our career to continue to advance, what can engineers do? What would you say? Well, thanks, Jared. So I, I talked about some of my milestones uh, in my career. Um, but you know, engineers can do an incredible thing. En engineers can be successful in a myriad of fields. Engineers are problem solvers. But being able to take that engineering background and apply it in different ways, it's, it's boundless what engineers can do. Uh, but I think also engineers, you, you take that foundation, no pun intended, even though I'm a geotech, <laughs> but you take that foundation and to be able to apply that in, in different ways is, is just invaluable. Uh, for me, especially being asked to develop and lead the, this new program in the wake of Hurricane Katrina, uh, that job was actually coded as an engineer because having those engineer skills and especially the geotech part was absolutely vital to figure out and work with a team on knowing what to do to put in a, a system of structures for storm damage risk reduction that had never been done before. Okay. And then finding myself at Arlington National Cemetery, something I would never have considered. But I tell you what, we have a lot of engineers there now, <laughs> not just our engineering team, that's what's in our infrastructure repair and improvement. But we have engineers working in other parts of the, uh, the business as well, just because of how much engineers can bring. Wow. That's awesome. That's awesome. Well, thank you so much for coming on and thank you for all the great insights you share with us. Thank you for your service to the industry and more importantly, thank you for your service to our nation. Oh, it's now, honor. if our listeners wanted to learn more about you or to find you, what's the best way for them to find you? I don't know if you're on social okay, media so first, or email yeah. or. Thank you. Uh, we do have a public website, OrlingtonCemetery.mil, that can tell you about all the different programs that we have. Excellent. Uh, I do have an official Twitter account, at right. Kate because so you can always find me okay. uh, on that as well. Um, I, have to, I tell you that I, I basically stay off Facebook these days just because it's just kind of become a mess. <laughs> 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 but you can find me through a public website, and you can absolutely always find me uh, on Twitter. Excellent. Excellent. Well, thank you so much for coming on. I really appreciate the time we were able to spend together. Thank you. It's been my honor. It's been fun. Thank you. I hope you enjoyed the episode today. We would love to hear your feedback, comments, and or questions. Please feel free to go to our webpage, which is geotechnicalengineeringpodcast.com, where you'll be able to find a summary of the key points discussed in today's episode, that being episode number five, as well as links to any of the resources, websites, or books mentioned during this episode. 
Until next time, we wish you all the very best in all of your geotechnical engineering endeavors. Peace.